here at the Brigham Young University in Utah, USA. He contributed to our conference a few years ago, and we invited him again because he's one of the very few and most important researchers in the context of systemic family therapy that can contribute with very robust data to the discussion of cost effectiveness of systemic psychotherapy. Um, he's undergoing that research for many, many years. And um, Professor Crane is also editor of a great journal, the journal um, Contemporary Family Therapy. As most of you will know, and now I come back to the German situation that Jochen Schweitzer was talking about, at the moment there is an evaluation process of systemic therapy of the German healthcare self-administration taking place concerning the question whether systemic therapy adds something to the psychotherapeutic care in Germany that um, the already public health insurance funded psychodynamic and behavioral therapies do not provide. I am a member of a small working group, also with Enno Hermanns together of systemic therapists, that try to support that process with lobby work. Um, the results of the research of Russell Crane is one of our strongest arguments in that process. So I'm very glad, dear Russ, that you will enrich our conference with your research treasures. Afterwards, we will discuss your results in a panel and with the audience. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm not sure if I should apologize for being the American speaker or not, but uh, I, will, I will make a, one caveat, and that is that I also have a dual citizenship in the Republic of Ireland. So I am actually European as well. I wanted to thank the organizers, Professor Schweitzer and Knox, for the kind invitation to be here, and it is indeed a privilege and an honor to have the time to visit with you. We're getting some help on technology here. This is good. I hope it will work. One of the things I wanted to, to say pretty emphatically before the, the lecture is if there's anyone here who has an idea of potentially collaborating on healthcare research, I'm very interested in visit, visiting with you personally uh, or by email or whatever. And the ability to identify and gather large scale research data with healthcare uh, data that links family members, that links psychotherapy data and physical health data is uh, extremely rare. And so it's been, you know, a lot of uh, kind of miracles that made this happen so far. So if, you're, if you have any thoughts on it at all, I'd love to visit with you. Let's see, there we go, there we go. I mentioned my, uh, put my email address here and seriously would like to hear from anybody who would like to say anything to me. It would be great. Also to thank the number of organizations who've worked to make this conference possible. It's important for, for me to acknowledge the people that have made this research program possible. And these are all members of the faculty, former students, professors at other universities that have helped make this possible, and without which and, you know, none of this would have happened, really. As far as institutional support, 
that made the funding available for this to, for this to occur. It's been primarily self-funded by the, the Brigham Young University in the School of Family Life. They provide small internal grants, and this research hasn't been hugely expensive. The most difficult part is uh, obtaining the data, cleaning it, and that's the most time consuming. But it's not a multi-million dollar project by any means. It's probably at most 100,000 uh, or so in all these studies. Uh, I should say also that the, when considering translating exchange rates, euros and dollars, I find it most helpful to not try to do that. It's best, in my opinion, in my understanding, is just to consider one is in one currency is the same as one in another currency. And it's, uh, that, to me, makes more, the most sense. We know that there's a substantial literature on the, excuse me, very simple information about the U.S. healthcare system, which you, you probably are aware of. It's a huge system, very complicated, very expensive. It's primarily a fee for service system where providers bill for the services they provide. Uh, it's, it's not primarily a, pre, a prepaid system. Some healthcare systems are paid by a series of taxation measures and the, the persons in need of care then can access those to, no, to little or, or no direct cost to themselves. So it's, a, it's not a prepaid model, although there, some of those exist in our, in our world. So the procedures are identified by the American Medical Association and everything that has any possibility of a medical intervention has a procedure code. You may have some of those similarly in your countries. These procedures provide the basis of payment. So if we're not doing procedures, we're not getting paid. So the drive then is to maximize the number of things that you do to increase the payment that you get. And sort of regardless of, some people would say regardless of what is best for people necessarily. That's a, not, that's a discussion for another day. We're funded by a combination of multiple public and private payers. There are literally hundreds of coverages, and I don't know how many systems, but for, for sure hundreds of systems, and for sure several thousand different plans. The most recent estimations I have on the funding of mental health come from two sectors. There's the private funding sector, which is private insurance, which comes from employee-based so employment-based, so that as a part of my contract for work, health insurance is a benefit. The employer pays, on average, about two-thirds of the cost of the premium. The employee pays, on average, about one-third of the cost of the premium. Out-of-pocket, of course, refers to the direct expense that uh, I, I have. And there's other funding from charitable organizations constitutes about 3%. The public funded systems include Medicaid, which is for the very, very poor, for children and, and for disabled adults. So for example, my brother has had two strokes and so he can't work full time and uh, his, so his care changed because he's disabled, his care changed from private insurance now to Medicaid because he's a disabled uh, person. And I'll give you another example of Medicaid in a minute. Medicare is a system for seniors, so 65 and above participate in Medicare. And there are a variety of other federal and state supported services systems like Veterans Administration operates is one of those operates under the federal umbrella. 
Family therapy has a substantial evidence base for the kind of the experimental and RCT world establishing its effectiveness for a number of different disorders and problem areas. These summaries have been published in a number of places and the others are available as well. My beginning proposition is that healthcare is a universal concern. The cost of healthcare continues to rise in most countries for a lot of reasons. But let me tell you a little uh, personal story. This is our granddaughter, Lauren, and she was born in 08. She's, this is her most recent surgery. And she um, has congenital central hypoventilation syndrome, which means she can't breathe if she's asleep. So in the womb, they identified that she wasn't uh, able to breathe the amniotic fluid. And so they took her out very, uh, pretty early and started assessing why she couldn't breathe. And, um, and she spent four, four months in one of the best in our area, uh, uh, neonatal intensive care units. She lived there for four months. And what the condition creates is if it's necessary for you to have a ventilator. And then if you fall asleep, the machine will take up your breathing for you. And she's had Oh, I don't know, I have lost count, but the most recent surgery is uh, this one, where she had a breathing pacemaker installed. So, he, so she has a heart pacemaker, a breathing uh, pacemaker, um, a number of other things. My best estimate of her cost of care in six years is between one and two million for her. The um, programming unit for programming the breathing pacemaker, you know, just about this big, and it cost $48,000 for that machine. And, and so I've been studying healthcare a long time, and we were, our families are going about our business, and then she was born, and, you know, she should have died. I don't know how many, it hasn't been too long, 30 years, 40 years at the most, where she would have been a stillborn child and you know, kind of that would have been the end of it. But with increases in medical technology and the availability of things that actually keep us alive, here she is, happy and happy. So she's a, she's a cute little kid. Probably her lifetime medical bills will, if nothing else, if nothing goes wrong, Three or four million is not, wouldn't surprise me for sure. The, um, the interesting thing about this system, our system is, and you'll hear me talk about Medicaid more, and Medicaid is a system that finances disabled adults and disabled children, and there's a prioritization that goes on. So in Utah, the priority is for children. And so if there's a, a number of X amount of money in the Medicaid budget, and there is, the priority goes first to disabled children down the line, and I don't know the rest of the list, but I know they're first. So they've paid, along with, with our son's private insurance, uh, all of the expenses for this. So it's, it's a really pretty extraordinary. We just emailed with our son last night and he said he's paid zero out of pocket for this care. So every, you know, everything, is, everything is about money and this is, I thought it was a good example. I mean, that's a lot of money. I don't know what you think, but that's a lot of money to me. That's lifetime earnings already of three professional people probably. So, anyway, 
to go on. A uh, couple of notes that are important in presenting this research is that we don't use, we have no ability to access identifiable healthcare records as protected by law and ethics. And we would be, we would be remiss in not mentioning that. You should note that individual and family therapy are paid for in reimbursement systems at the same rate per hour. So it's an hour of therapy is the same cost, no matter which form it takes. What we're paid, it depends on our degree earned, the maximum degree we've earned, or, and or our license level. So family therapy in the US is called marriage and family therapy, or a couple marriage and family therapy as a license, is a master's level degree. Then there are people with um, PhDs, of course, but relatively few. So, but the way we're, rate we're paid by insurance companies is based on our degree in licensure. So I, I, I left, started this wondering if, if family therapy and mental health care is useful, then why would we not want to use it? Well, there are a few barriers. The first one, of course, is that payers are rightfully worried about the potential of increased cost when you uh, make a, another service available. It, people don't like to change systems that are in place anymore. Systems don't like to change any more than I want to change or any of us want to change our family, our behavior, what we're doing, what we're thinking. And it causes a bit of fright and anxiety. For providers, family therapy is, I think, uniquely difficult. In my, in my work, anyway, I, the work hours are less convenient, so I don't work a normal work hour day if I'm trying to accommodate multiple family members. That pushes work into afternoons, evenings, sometimes on Saturdays. That's not convenient. Scheduling is difficult, uh, and the re multiple relationships that are acting simultaneously are quite difficult to manage. So they might be a potential barrier to why family therapy is not uh, included. So we will be presenting, uh, I'll be presenting results from three uh, real world settings. These aren't experimental labs. They're not randomized clinical trials. They're what we call uh, effectiveness research, which is what happens in the, you know, the real world, in the field, with the average practitioner, the average um, patient. So it's really not very fancy. We have three systems that we've studied in different waves. The first one was a regional health maintenance organization it had about 180,000 subscribers. And it, it may be interested to know that at the time this data was developing, this particular plan was one of about five competing for employer market share in that area. So it's a competitive, uh, competitive system. Then we went to, had some data from the state of Kansas from the Medicaid system. And then finally from Cigna, which is a, a large manager of, of healthcare services in the, in the US, about 15 million people participate in uh, Cigna programs. So this is, a, this is a kind of research, effectiveness research, which is, is, not, test, is not designed to test for causality. So arguments about this is better than that or are, are not really accurate because you can't randomly assign people when you're talking about, you know, a million people. You can't randomly assign them to conditions or diagnostic or anything or providers or anything like that. So this is evaluating, not trying to establish causality and that's not the goal. We're wondering about does early on medical 
people were doing medical offset studies and this would be in the 90s, they found that individual group therapy decre tend to decrease use of physical health services. And no one had done that much in family therapy, so we launched to try to start doing that. And then even more interesting, I thought, was that if we can identify any kind of medical ch use change in the individual patient, that's good. We can do that. And everybody can have been able to do that at that time. We we're also interested to see if people, other people in the family were influenced as well. So would child, in, child receiving care, family involved, would dad or mom or sibling change their health care as well after the therapy? Okay, this is uh, the first set of studies. This is from the subscriber base of 180,000, the uh, regional health plan. It is a, a retrospective study. So it has uh, strengths and limit limitations. This kind of study always has this set of advantages and disadvantages we can discuss in a minute. We are interested in following the subscribers in this particular system. So it was everyone who received psychotherapy was available for selection. Uh, we we, we uh, literally pulled paper charts from everybody who received psychotherapy and identified six different, until we filled six different groups of 60 participants each. I should say that the review process for approval to do this was about 18 months. So it is significant, as you can see, as you can imagine, significant care. So we had uh, 60 individual therapy folks, couples of marital therapy, we had 30 and 22. We actually ran out of cases before we found a, whole, a full set of women in the, to make 30 in that group. And then, uh, of course, family therapy as the identified patient, and family therapy as the other person, the other person who attended therapy. And then uh, con comparison groups. So we thought it would be a good idea to see what happens to people over the time period in